God. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. <coughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's stand. good and gracious God and Heavenly Father, we praise you for your care for us, and we ask that you would uh, bless us um, um, with your approval of our um, worship of you. We ask that you'd help us to examine ourselves so that we might uh, uh, repent of our sins, and uh, we, we thank you that you are a forgiving God, and that uh, uh, your spirit works in us to Cause us to seek righteousness and to and to hate more and more learn to hate sin. We ask that your um, your spirit would work in and through us, through our families, through our uh, vocations, and through our personal relations. And we pray that uh, you would further and further sanctify us, so that we might be more what you would have us to be, and that we would become faithful servants of of your kingdom. We thank you that uh, uh, your church is. Uh, growing in many parts of the world. And we think particularly of those who are persecuted. Uh, we think of the, the persecuted church in China that has increasingly suffered persecution. We think of those in Islamic countries that are, are facing persecution. We thank you for the growth that is, is happening in these countries despite the persecution. And we thank you for the testimony of, of uh, what true faith means uh, to these uh, saints. And we, we pray that you would... Uh, uh, help those who are seeking to help those in, in very material and immediate ways. We now ask that you accept our words of praise. And, and uh, with all the saints of old, and, and uh, we, we, we acknowledge that all good things we have come from you, and we acknowledge our dependence on you to, to understand uh, our lives and our, our times and our responsibilities. Uh, bless us now with uh, your approving presence. We ask in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. Our opening hymn is hymn number 296. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. 296.
Our responsive reading this morning is Soldier Selection 66, found on page 657 of our Soldier Booklets from Psalms 129 and 130. Soldier Selection 66, found on page 657 of our Soldier Booklet, Psalm 129 and 130. Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth, may Israel now say. Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed upon my back, they made long their furrows. The Lord is righteous, he hath cut asunder the cords of the wicked. Let them all be confounded and turned back that hate Zion. Let them be against grass upon the housetops which withereth before it groweth up. Wherewith the mower filleth not his hand, nor he that findeth seeds his bosom. Neither do they which the Lord I say, the blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice, let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, should smart iniquities, O Lord, who can, shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's confess our faith together by reciting together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture this morning is going to be from John 16, from verse 16 to 33. But before we go to John 16, I want to read John's introduction, which is John 1, the first 18 verses. So we'll start with John 1. 1 through 18, and then go to chapter 16, which is our text. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, 
he hath declared him. Now let's turn to our text for this morning, which is John 16, verse 16 through 33, at the end of the chapter. John 16, 16. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples amongst themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, and because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, What is this that he saith a little while. We cannot tell what he said. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she has delivered of the child, and remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever... Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and she was, ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and have come into the world. Again I leave the world, and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou come, camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. There are two separate words that Jesus uses in verse 16. Both are translated in the English as see. In fact, we, both, we, we often have multiple definitions of the same English word in a dictionary, and both are very commonly used definitions of the word see. First of all, Jesus said, A little while, and ye shall not see me. The word see there in the Greek refers to physical sight. Jesus was referring to his coming departure when he would no longer be with them. Then Jesus says, a little while and ye shall see me because I go to the Father. That word see is a different Greek word and it implies more than physical sight. It can imply discernment to see the meaning of something. Jesus is saying, very shortly you will no longer behold me, but you will perceive the meaning of who I am because I go to the Father. Where we are now in John's account, in the upper room, a very short time before the arrest, the disciples still didn't fully perceive who Jesus was. They believed he was the Son of God, they believed he was the Messiah, but they didn't fully understand the nature of his reign as king. They didn't understand the atonement, certainly. John is going back, and he's relating some history that took place there in the upper room. 
Part of the history that John's relating is the fact that the disciples did not understand because he wants his readers to understand their learning curve. So, but John had begun his gospel as a mature, older apostle. He looked back and he could understand a great deal more. So you could say that the beginning of John is, is sort of like his introduction to a lot of the narrative uh, that is in the rest of the gospel. It represent his, his, represents his more mature understanding of who Jesus was. He didn't begin as a confused disciple in the upper room, but as an understanding apostle who now perceived he saw more clearly in that second sense of, of the word. It was in that mature understanding that he said in chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. But here in our text in chapter 16, John recounts where he and the others were in this learning curve. Jesus is even telling them that you're not... You're not very far in the learning curve. You've got a, long, a lot that you're going to understand. But, he's saying, you're going to understand shortly. He has referred already twice in the upper room to the coming of the Holy Spirit. In verse 13, he said the Spirit would guide them into all truth. Well, after Jesus says that, that they'll understand more shortly, the disciples talk amongst themselves. Obviously, they didn't know what they didn't know. And they're, so they're, they're sharing their ignorance with one another and, and admitting we don't know. He's saying we're going to understand, but why is he telling us we're going to understand more? Why can't we understand now? Why doesn't he just say it now? Why do we have to wait to understand? They didn't fully understand. But likely also, what they did understand... was disturbing to them. They likely understood that Jesus has, is saying, I'm going where you cannot go. They likely understood that they would no longer be with him. After three years, that was disconcerting all by itself. Now they're saying, Jesus is saying, when I go, you're going to understand more. And that was somewhat hurtful, says, why don't you tell us now exactly what we need to know? None of this was fitting in with their expectations. How could there be a kingdom if the king, the Lord, was leaving? How could it advance without him? Jesus had prophesied his death. Two days earlier, he said, in two days I go to Jerusalem and will be crucified. They didn't like that talk. They had to have associated that with the fact that he was leaving them. Disciples were also likely somewhat hurt because Jesus said they didn't understand. They wanted to understand after three plus years, why do they have to still wait? Why isn't Jesus being explicit in telling them what they need to understand? But Jesus is not doing this to scold them for their ignorance or for their lack of understanding. He reassures them in verse 20. He says, Ye shall weep and lament, but the, word, world, and the, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. The world, that is the world of sin and evil, did rejoice at the death of Jesus Christ while his followers suffered. But at the resurrection, their sorrow was turned to joy. Jesus knew this was going to be hard on the disciples, and he was reassuring them that their sorrow would melt away because they would see, they would perceive, they would understand then much more fully. Believers are now often like the disciples then. They think they know what's going to happen. They think they understand where their faith is taking them. And then something happens and 
they realize they don't fully understand and they're frustrated why they don't fully understand. Sometimes it's their own error. Sometimes in recent years, it's been their error about the Bible. The pre-trib rapture eschatology has confused a lot of people. It was once a very dominant theme in, in Christian circles in, in, when I was uh, younger. In fact, I can remember um, kids when I was in college, they would get on a roll and says, well, this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen in the Middle East, and then this is going to happen, and Jesus is going to come back. They, they thought they had this scenario, and they could recite that scenario very quickly. Well, all their expectations have failed. All their timetables have failed. And that had to be very discouraging. But they had things wrong. They thought they understood, but they didn't. The disciples are in much the same place. They thought they understood things that Jesus is saying you don't understand. It's easy to take parts of the Bible also and focus on them and make them the center of your faith. The center of our faith isn't about peace and joy and how fulfilling the faith is to us. If it's about you, you may be very discouraged at things that happen to you in life. Well, the disciples were thinking in terms, at least in part, of a false eschatology. Their, their kingdom was, uh, would have had to assume that Jesus was going to be present. That's the only kind of kingdom they understood. And how could they understood the king, understand the kingdom now, after three years, if Jesus says, I'm leaving, and where I'm going, you can't come? It's hard to reorient your thinking. A lot of those churches that talked constantly about eschatology have gone on to other things. Interestingly enough, they haven't reoriented their eschatology in many cases. They just stopped talking about eschatology so much because they've been wrong so much and they're tired of being wrong. Well, it's hard to reorient your thinking, but Jesus is telling them that's going to have to happen and it will happen shortly. He, he's preparing them but he's also reassuring them that they're going to understand shortly. In verse 12, he had told them, you can't bear more right now. I'm really sparing you by not telling you more. So he moves right past their difficulties and says, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Your actual sorrow, the cause of your sorrow, his crucifixion is going to be turned into joy. He's not saying, I'm going to take your sorrow and going to put it to one side and something else is going to come along that's going to give you joy. He says, the cause of your sorrow is going to turn to joy. He compares that sorrow turning to joy to a woman's pain in childbirth. Particularly, it says, when the, a boy is born. Now, the Greek does refer specifically to a male. This doesn't mean that a daughter doesn't bring joy, just that a boy brought a particular kind of joy to a family. For one thing, it brought the continuity, it, it assured the continuity of the family name. It also meant an, a very real economic future for the family that it wouldn't have without a male heir. It meant that there was labor. There, it meant that there would be financial security for the, the uh, parents in their old age. The male also represented a covenant headship and continuity of authority. So Jesus says in verse 22, you will rejoice in your Joy will never be lost. The disciples' cause for rejoicing is also ours. The resurrection displaces all reasons for sorrow and pessimism. Soon enough, the disciples would understand that. The resurrection means that God can displace death itself. In fact, this is what's so important to remember. The doctrine of the, the resurrection of believers uh, used to be very prominent in Christian teaching because it was um, a necessary hope for the future. 
that even our death will be undone. You don't hear as much about the resurrection anymore. And people have funny ideas about afterlife today that have kind of imposed themselves. But the, our physical resurrection from the dead, God undoing death itself, is an essential part of the gospel message. We can, now we can see Christ clearly. We can perceive him. We can understand him as John did when he was writing chapter 1. The mature disciple was saying, this is what we know. And then he goes back and he gives some of the history of their learning curve. In terms of this greater understanding of who Jesus is, we are told to pray in his name. Jesus has spoken of praying in his name before. When they see Jesus, when they understand Jesus, they'll ask nothing. That sounds like an odd statement that you'll ask nothing. Because he's saying you'll know the answers to a lot of these questions you currently have. When you understand, you won't have to ask like you so often ask me questions. Or you want to ask me questions, but you're, they were afraid to ask him questions. We see that more than once. The disciples really wanted to ask Jesus, and they talked amongst themselves, so they, it, it, so they shared their ignorance, but they were afraid to ask Jesus what they needed to know. The questions that then swirled through their minds would be clarified, so they won't even have to ask a lot of those questions. And in fact, then their prayers would be directly to the Father. This is important, you see. There's... This is a very Trinitarian passage here. Jesus is going to the Father. The Spirit is coming to them to be their advocate. And their prayers then would be to the Father in Jesus' name, enabled by the Spirit. So the Trinity is very much present in what Jesus is describing here in the upper room. The sight, the perception that Jesus has told them will be coming soon, was what has been called epistemological self-consciousness. That's a mouthful. Epistemology is the, um, is the study of knowledge. How do we know anything? Well, epistemological self-consciousness is knowing what we know, knowing what we believe, and why we believe it knowing that we can be certain about what we believe to be true. That is not just an idea we have that may or may not be true, but that, that it, it isn't actually true. Why is that? It's because of what, the, what God has told us. So all of our knowledge comes from God, and Jesus is saying you're going to have better understanding shortly after the resurrection. And of course, Christ taught them after the resurrection, before his ascension, then he says the Holy Spirit is going to come when I depart again. So there are some questions we don't have to even ask anymore because they're all laid out for us. We know them. That's what he's saying. You won't have to ask some questions. In fact, we pray in terms of what we do know. We pray in terms of the certainty that we know certain things. Well, the disciples didn't yet have the full picture of the atonement. They didn't have the full picture of the reign of Jesus as Lord from the right hand of the throne. And Jesus knows this. In verse 25, Jesus acknowledges to them that his teaching to them has been somewhat obscured by his method of teaching them through Proverbs or that can, word could be translated parables. Jesus promises them, though, that they would very soon understand. The second word in verse 16, we said that the second word for see meant a perception, an understanding. After a while, they would not physically see Jesus, but soon thereafter, they would more fully understand him. And in fact, between the resurrection and the ascension, or we could say even the, the resurrection and Pentecost, the disciples came to understand Christ and their role much more fully. 
And we can understand Jesus in the same way now, more fully than the disciples could even in the upper room. Confusion, Jesus says, is going to yield to understanding. Jesus was even going to give them immediate access to the Father in prayer. That was a powerful statement to a Jew. The Jews' access to God was through the temple, through the priesthood. You had to have an intermediary if you went before God. Direct access to the Father put, in a Jew's mind, put them on the same level as the patriarchs or the prophets who had received word directly from God. Verse 27 gives the grounds of this access. God loves them because they loved Jesus and knew that he came from God. At the beginning of chapter 16, Jesus had warned them of the hostility of the Jews. That's where he said, they're going to put you out of the synagogues. I want to warn you. The place where you think you, you have your best audience, in, in the end, they're going to throw you out of the synagogues. But you, now he says, will have direct access to the Father. The synagogue is where they think they're going to hear the word of God, but you're going to have direct access to the Father. That was a bombshell to the disciples. That's why they note something, verse 29. It says, you're speaking very plainly. You're not speaking in parables to us anymore. You're speaking very plainly. When you told the Jew then that you're going to have direct access to the Father, they said, okay, we understand that. You're speaking very plainly. And again, they profess their faith in verse 30. They said, now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee? By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. John, by the way, never uses the word faith as a noun. Same thing with belief. Faith and believe were verbs. John uses faith or believe 98 times, and each time it's as a verb. It's something you do. It's not a thing. Faith is an action based upon who Jesus is, and that's how Jesus uses his. Jesus is not questioning whether they have something called faith. Jesus is asking, do you know what your faith is going to entail? Do you now have a faith, an active faith, that can handle what I'm talking about? They couldn't exactly answer that question, really. But they said, Jesus is implying there's going to be a lot involved, a lot of action and response from you involved if you truly believe that. And in fact, the disciples had no idea what was going to be expected of them as apostles. Jesus had already told Peter that he was going to deny him. He's already said, you're going to be scattered for a time. You're going to weep and lament. You're going to have tribulation. You're going to be thrown out of the synagogues. He's already intimated some of the issues they're going to have. But Jesus also has reassured them that they will come through with a stronger faith. They will see Jesus. They will understand him. They'll perceive who he is more. And Jesus then says, Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Our faith is really being challenged when we think the cause of Christ and his kingdom is failing. To be of good cheer is to be courageous. It's to have an optimistic faith. You cannot be courageous in, a, in battle by believing you're going to lose. If you believe you're going to lose, there's no point to do anything. A courageous man is one who moves forward in difficulty. And so Jesus says, move forward when it's difficult because I have overcome the world. I've already accomplished the victory. Move forward in terms of what you profess. On the eve of his execution, Jesus announces, I have overcome the world. The Holy Spirit regenerates us by giving us faith. It's through that gift of faith that we see Jesus. 
we perceive him, we understand who he is. When Jesus asked the disciples if they believed, it was not to doubt it. It was to point out that as yet they didn't know what their active faith would actually involve. The new sight referred to in verse 16 was a combination of their faith, their knowledge, and the work of the Spirit. John is writing more than a history of Jesus here. He's showing the origin of his apostleship and the basis of his ministry and that of the other apostles. It was this understanding of who Jesus was and what he did. This is why John wrote in chapter 1, verse 14, And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. That was John, the mature John, looking back and saying, we didn't realize it at the time, but we beheld the glory of God in the flesh. Let's pray. Our most good and gracious God and heavenly Father, we pray that you would uh, cause us to more and more perceive, to see uh, who Jesus Christ is, not just in theology, in words, but help us to see him in terms of the big picture of all of history. Help us to be courageous. Help us to move forward with an act of faith because of who we believe Jesus is and what he has done. Give us a confident faith. Give us a faith that, 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 that smells victory in the air. Encourage us by the power of your spirit to serve you in word and thought and deed today and in this coming week, we pray. In Christ our Savior's name, amen. Our closing hymn is hymn 116. 116, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. No, for the beauty of the earth. 116, for the beauty of the earth. Let us stand and sing <coughs> for the beauty of the earth.
now go in peace. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you, guide and protect you, this day and always. Amen. Thank you.